Good evening. My name is Kutan Ayata. I'm one of the three members of the 2020 Young Architects Plus Designers Committee. In addition to being one half of Young and Ayata, I'm also an associate professor and the vice chair of the Department of Architecture and Urban Design at UCLA. I'm very excited to introduce the two Architecture League Prize winners tonight. On the night number two, we are welcoming rigorous designers who are also full-time teachers in significant institutions educating the next generation of architects. They are David Eskenazi of DESK, who teaches as a full-time faculty at SciArc in Los Angeles, Leslie Locke and Sacha Zukovic of HANA, both of whom are assistant professors at Cornell in Ithaca. Their creative body of work is impressive and full of potential. Their written contributions to the discursive growth of architecture is already significant. More on the winners in just a minute. First about the team value. So much has changed since the day of the jury when we contemplated the merits of what was in front of us, the potentials of their trajectories. The world which defined our value structures has been shaken to its core. Our way of life evolved radically through these last few months, unknown for how much longer. Things we took so much for granted vanished from our daily lives. We embraced a new collective which sacrificed individual comfort for the health and well-being of our most vulnerable. We started to confront a long overdue racial injustice in our society, in our discipline at last. For this generation of young architects who are on the springboard to leap forward towards the next chapter of their speculative journey, it will be interesting to see how this significant moment tests their resolve, alters their discourse, reaffirms their convictions, and redefines their values in a moment of cultural unrest and transformation. Together with Mira Henry and Kevin Hurt, as the 2020 Young Architects Designers Committee, we wanted to develop a team for this year's edition of the competition by casting a large net to register the pulse of young designers who are developing in a discipline without a definitive center. Our goal was to establish a broad enough team which would hopefully push the entrants to formulate their arguments in an extremely specific and precise manner in their response. The word value can be stretched in any one direction. Value can be understood as economy, as color, as measure, as ethics, as well as aesthetics. In its essence though, it's what drives our individual take on the world as we project onto its collective future. The diverse spectrum of positions taken by all the entrants reinforced our reading of the moment in the discipline of architecture, which seems to be orbiting around multiple centers, generally independent from one another's gravitational pull, rarely letting other forces influence their own isolated spheres, keeping their values in separate walls. It's crucial though to find overlapping interests amongst varying positions, so new discourse can be cultivated through exchange, collaboration, friction, agreement, and yes, productive disagreement. The two practices we are celebrating here tonight thread through each other's territory of investigation in an interesting manner. While the initial set of triggering architectural ideas, their representations, engagement of digital technologies, means and methods of design execution, their physical manifestation, attitudes towards fabrication radically differ in each practice, to subvert the commonly accepted and calcified notions of materiality and their unexplored aesthetic expressions seem to be a shared ambition. David Eskenazi's work is rigorous, disciplined, and perplexing. His fascination with paper, both in its semantics and materiality, produced an unusual body of work which manages to turn slumpy, clumsy, mundane, and casual into a strangely expressionless fantastic. Paper, which is commonly used in architectural circles as a material or specific geometry, and material properties hand in hand fight gravity. Skinazi lets gravity dictate how the material conforms in its slow failure, resulting in fascinating tectonics. But this is no pure act of material parametrics. This craftful and virtuosic performance to mediate back and forth between the analog and digital realms gives the work an uncanny sense of ambiguity where gravity less digital input is pit against physical performance. What looks effortless and easy is in fact a disciplined labor of intuitive subversion of familiar material properties. The jury quickly recognizes sustained efforts and rigor in the work's current status and its future potentials. Leslie Locke and Sasha Zukovic of Hannah, on the other hand, are perhaps more akin to mad digital fabricators. 
only they don't seem to be interested in bracketing themselves within commonly established aesthetics of digital fabrication. The fetish of new technologies or their idealism play no part in their explorations and expressions. They make their own 3D printers, hack software systems, generate systemic rule sets to tailor the way in which they impose their will on material work configurations, invent new ways in which digital fabrication protocols are utilized, all towards the possibility of alternate aesthetic contemplations. Their action cabin immediately captured the imagination of the entire jury. Their approach to sustainability, the unexpected ease of robotics on timber, retaking the notion of building foundations, the odd expression of assembly, and the casual but disciplined formal definitions of an architectural primitive were few traits of discussion triggered by the project. It is exciting to feel the creative pressures of the next generation of architects. It makes me question my own biases and settled assumptions about how I assume the limits of architecture. I'm happy that I got ex exposed to your sensibilities. I certainly learned from you and I will certainly be on the lookout to see how your practice and teaching will develop into the future, influencing the younger generation of architects that will follow you. Congratulations. Let's find out what you have in store for us. Just a quick reminder for our general audience. Please remember to stay for the live session following the pre-recorded presentations by the winners, when we'll have a moderated conversation. We will also field audience questions received via Zoom chat. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I wish we were together tonight, um, and I hope that you're all healthy. Uh, thank you to the Architectural League, uh, to Anne, Katerina, and Sarah uh, for putting this all together, and to the jury uh, for selecting me for this year's League Prize. Um, I really appreciate that you support young architects uh, in whatever form their work comes in. Um, it's a real honor, so thank you so much. Uh, this year's competition theme value uh, is certainly on point for what the year has come to be a year to re-examine how values have been constructed in our society. I believe that we must all take on the work of dismantling racist policies, advocate for strong global health leadership, uh, and plan for the coming climate catastrophe. I can't claim that my work in any way <laughs> addresses these urgent issues, but I do hope that the pursuit of architectural questions and speculation is still welcome in today's moment. I believe the value of architecture is to question all of the weight that comes to bear where we plan before we build. So I had a hard time negotiating two impulses that I had for today's lecture. On one hand uh, was to speak about the ideas I've had for a few years concerning zooming in models. On the other hand, I've had a sense to speak about queerness in architecture. The first is disciplinary, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, and the second is more personal and difficult to unpack. As I grappled with the right topic for tonight, I realized that Zooming and queerness might not be that far apart, so please bear with me uh, as I try, successfully or not, uh, to tie them together as I present my work. Architecture imagines large objects in the world that scale up from documents. We could describe scale as the value of enlargement from a set of drawings or models. We construct a one-to-one -one drawing or model to imagine something palpable, probably small, that only a handful of people will get to see, use, and construct. On the other hand, we make one to 1,000 documents to coordinate construction and plan for use by many. Scale is the means by which all architects bias one value over another perhaps social organization at 1 to 100, or detail assembly at 1 to 10. Scale isn't simply a material proposition. It embeds audiences, regulations, collaborators, and labor into our imagination. Scale is a value agnostic to the shape of architecture, but biased towards its material details. Zooming, on the other hand, doesn't bias one over another. Something small is the same as something big. In my work, I imagine an architecture shaped by Zoom's materiality. I make models at various sizes and I'm interested in their differences. I let those models stand, sag, and slump. I draw at different Zooms and compare results. My practice engages both built and speculative work, but 
by always considering the working spaces that the work is imagined within. The digital models are already physical, the drawings already digital. I embed these differences into the shape of the architecture too. The practice's work aims to flatten the hierarchies of scale drawing, the separation of small from large, from one of, from many, of instruction from imagination. I favor zooming and I work on scale because the scale works on us. I'm going to show four recent projects, a vacation house, an installation, a speculative form, and a proposal for a public bathhouse. <clears throat> um, these were completed with an incredible team uh, whose effort I want to acknowledge, uh, Julie Riley, Jishan Wen, and Jutra Brown. Thank you all so much. Uh, so I'm going to start with a vacation house currently under construction in the Yucatan. It's in Mexico, deep in the jungle, a few hundred feet from the ocean, um, and it's titled Zigger Hut. There's a main house. Uh, I'm sorry, it takes the form of two stepped forms within the courtyard bounded by a perimeter wall. There's a main house, a guest house, and a pool. The project begins from local construction methods, in this case, uh, concrete masonry unit construction on a low budget. The name Ziggur Hut comes from the form of the ziggurat. In Yucatan, we find Mayan stepped pyramids, most famously Chichen Itza nearby. The step form is found in many diverse prehistoric societies, although only those in Mesopotamia are named ziggurats. The form interests me as a foreigner working in this area for its sense of universalism and specificity, the local and the global, and the sense of stepping as a kind of spatial ascension in a domestic setting. The project began by thinking about the idea of scale in relationship to shape and human reference. Both houses are the same rectangular step form with windows and doors. In the left drawing, the houses are shown at the same scale. You can see that they're different sizes and that the windows are scalable. But the door, because it's specific to a human size, doesn't change. On the right is a drawing showing the houses at the same size drawn at different scales as a way to compare the similarities of shape in the sense that the door is size specific. This drawing I would call a zoomed working space, the space in which my practice designs. Human figures annotate the size while all things are zoomed to the same level. Here are the two forms. The left is the main house. It's a two-story house that consists of a bedroom and living spaces while the guest house on the right includes two bedrooms and a bathroom. They're both casually intersected by a stair. Uh, one stair you can walk up and the other is a differently sized form of a stair. In this plan, uh, you can see the main house in the lower left of the drawing. Uh, maybe you can see my cursor, I'm not sure. I'll move it over. Uh, and the guest house is in the upper right uh, part of the plan. The site is bounded by a perimeter wall where outdoor showers and fireplaces uh, intersect the wall and surround a courtyard and pool. Here in the ground plan, you can see the living spaces of the main house. Uh, you can see the dining space, the kitchen, living spaces. Uh, you can also see in the guest house, the two bedrooms and uh, the shared bathroom. In the outdoor spaces, the pool, uh, a space for outdoor dining, and a kind of garden uh, in the upper left. There's a sense that the stepping feels like three-story buildings when in fact they're much smaller, a two-story and a single-story building. But what I love about this image is that you get the sense of a kind of urbanism or a city a much, at a much smaller scale, but in fact located in the middle of the jungle. The house is currently under construction. Here you see some of the details of the Mason reconstruction. Um, I especially love how the texture of the unfinished wall makes it seem wooly and soft in contrast to the exacting geometric intersections you can see on the right. While working on this project, I was invited to construct an installation at Winbury University, uh, where I chose to make a one to two scale model of the Zigger Hut. This image is a photograph of a model that was built after the installation was completed, and I'll return to this in one minute. In thinking about the form of the stepped massing of Zigger Hut, I thought of uh, Robert Smithson's pointless vanishing point, where Smithson constructs a sculpture that reifies the three-dimensional space suggested by two-dimensional perspectival construction. 
The sculpture can be seen as a kind of material diagram that exists between the material physical world and the conceptual space of a perspective, perspective drawing. I thought that a model of the ziggurat would occupy a similar space, a material diagram, but I was interested in size in the sense that Smithson's sculpture could be built at any size. Its physicality, while real, is not specific. We built uh, this version of the Smithson sculpture uh, based on the Zigger hut, as you can see here, but now with a sense of specific materiality. It's constructed of loose craft paper, letting it slump. Its form is size specific and it can't be scaled up or down. Uh, and we named this installation slump model. Here are the different sizes of um, building the truncated step mass at different sizes of craft paper. Uh, in the smallest on the left, you can see that the paper generally keeps the precision of geometry. And as the model gets bigger, um, as it approaches the size of the gallery all the way on the right, uh, you'll see that the material lets go of its geometric rig and slumps down. In that version, I mean, you can really see how wild it gets. Uh, and this is also the version where we add the windows and doors uh, back into it. The plan of the gallery at Woodbury takes after the gallery's name, the Wedge Gallery, which is a kind of perspectival construct. The model is formed to the plan and takes up as much space as it can while allowing for visitors to walk around it. Uh, this is the interior compared to a construction photo of Zigger Hut. Uh, there are tent poles resting in concrete masonry units that the paper rests on. In the back, you can see the smaller windows and doors, and it feels quite intimate. Uh, compared to, you know, where the house kind of lands. And this is a photograph of the exterior of the installation. The form is a bit tired, it's slumping, it's not geometric, it doesn't resist gravity, it seems, uh, it seems a bit worn out. This work for me uh, led to a new series of ideas about materiality and models. It recalls some previous conversations uh, about paper architecture and the sense of the unbuilt in architecture as model. To me, this project opens up a new conversation within that world, one that suggests a closer look at the role of size-specific forms and the architectural models uh, that would accompany them. The work of artists like Eva Hesse and Robert Gover come to mind. For Hesse on the left, Seriality is a form of comparing the slight differences that emerge from handmade fiberglass cylinders, each slightly slumped and arranged differently in each installation. The forms allow material to react to geometry and the arrangement is not specific. I pair Hesse with a sculpture by Robert Gober because Gober's sculpture is figural, whereas Hesse's is abstract. In Gober's piece, a body is sculpted to look like a paper bag. The figure has traits associated with gen gendered bodies the female breast, the male chest hair. As figural as it is, the sculpture is also bound by a rectangle enclosed in an abstract frame. The sculpture is life-size, yet the folds of the paper are enlarged. It's both real and a model. It exists across boundaries of gender, figuration, and realness. The activist Alexander Leon recently said, queer people don't grow up as ourselves. We grow up playing a version of ourselves that sacrifices authenticity to minimize humiliation and prejudice. The massive task of our adult lives is to unpack which parts of ourselves are truly us and which parts we've created to protect us. This sentiment rings true to me. As a young queer architect, I've been negotiating the models I've been handed of how architects behave, work, and carry deep-seated values against who I am and want to be. My work, in a sense, is a start at unpacking what models of architecture I've received and trying to construct alternate ones. It's not to say that I believe there is a search for truth and queerness, not at all. Instead, I believe uh, queerness is a frame for floating identities, for needing or not needing nomination, and for not requiring any explanation. My work takes this on through its material ease, its speculative nature, and its optimism. It looks under the hood, so to speak, at biases and defaults for other possible genres of architectural work. Uh, in some ways, um, I think of my thoughts on queerness as I look at Hesse's work, conceptual, untamable, and fleeting. 
uh, these two projects, these two references, although not made from paper, they have something to speak to when thinking of querying the authenticity of models and materials. I think of Sarah Ahmed's recent book, The Uses of Use, where she speaks to the sense of papering over parts of ourselves and producing paperwork as a way to reify the gaps of bureaucracy. Paper and materials themselves <clears throat> are one form of authenticity, but as they meet the world of zooming and digital interfaces, I believe they open up more identities to and queer some, <clears throat> excuse me, some architectural genres. <clears throat> this diagram and image uh, are a latent theory for what this might mean moving forward in my work. A queer model authenticity can float between actual materials models of materials in a new unknown digital materiality. This diagram is a way to start to represent the idea that an architecture could float between all three of these categories. The image on the right is a hopeful idea of what this could be. The goal of the work would be to imagine pulling this kind of image apart so that the human arms are the same size but we didn't have two separate forms. It's also a sense to suggest that architecture is just as important as the things that annotate it and that the annotated forms, things like people uh, in an image like this, um, tell us as much about the work as the work itself. And the next two projects are first attempt at working on these kinds of ideas. <clears throat> in this project titled Two Scrolls, Hesse Cylinder is doubled into a form of a scroll and built at two sizes, nine inches and three feet. It's modeled physically out of paper and digitally in a physics simulation engine. The form is both solid and rendered as a structural wireframe. The idea of a queer model authenticity would be to construct an architecture model from all of these tests, from physical paper zooms and from digital size simulations. Here's one attempt at putting all of these things together. Uh, this model uh, is a model that's constructed of 3D printed parts from those digital physics simulations and from paper itself, which you can see is hiding inside the model there. The windows on this model suggest that the uh, model represents a large building. Um, and uh, you can begin to see some of the layers of this thing in the uh, section here, which suggests stairs, floors, structure, and enclosure. In this alternate version, also made from those same uh, tests, oops, sorry, here we, go. Uh, we can see the same window is much larger, suggesting that this represents a much smaller building. Here, uh, the exterior is actual pieces of is an actual piece of paper, uh, whereas the interior is a three D printed simulation of a larger piece of paper. And in the section, we can start to see the stairs also seem much larger, but the elements are still present of structure and enclosure. With the exterior shells removed, we can see that on the inside, the materials are reversed. What was paper on the exterior of the small building is a simulation on the interior and vice versa for the larger building. These models are size specific. They can't be constructed at any other size and their architecture is dependent on the performance of this model. I'll finish today um, just by showing uh, some images from the online exhibition uh, that you can find on the Architectural League's website. Um, the exhibition shows a recent project proposal uh, for a bathhouse in Los Angeles that builds on the ideas um, of this previous scroll project. Uh, the project is titled Inhale, Exhale, Sag, Flex, and takes the form of two masses with opposing ideas of form and materiality. This exhibit displays uh, a proposal for using city-owned lots in Los Angeles to develop flexible, easily fabricated public bathhouses. The public bathhouse exists as an urban utility that produces an aura of collective imagination. Its primary function is to clean and relax bodies that are worked out in the city, but it's remembered as a space where foreign bodies care for themselves in a manner that is both personal and collective. Like the bodies within it, the bathhouse's architecture is continuously sanitized and maintained. The proposal is composed of two buildings, the steam house on the left and the pool house here on the right. Uh, and they're separated by stair. 
The steam house on the left flex is enclosed by an expanding quilt of water bladders that fill up as steam evaporates and bodies exhale. The pool house sag is supported by a frame structure wrapped by building paper. The paper is periodically removed and dried once it's become too wet and soggy from absorbing pool splashes and water steam. Both buildings are interior landscapes of curtains, pipes, water, steam, plunges, and bodies, where both architecture and people unrobe and collectively self-care. Here in the section, uh, you'll see on the left is again the steam house, and its, uh, and its center is a large water bladder tank uh, that contains all of the hot water for the building. Um, and it's uh, expanding into uh, the steam room above. And the enclosure of uh, the steam house is also uh, these water bladder tanks. On the right is the pool house uh, with a weight of water bearing down from its cold water tank on the roof and the pool on the second floor. Here uh, is the ground floor plan. You'll notice there's no quote unquote front door. There's just an entrance to walk in. Um, this is for the whole community. There's no permanent walls. Everything is thought of as material and infrastructure and is flexible. Uh, things are enclosed in curtains or through piping that might prevent somebody from walking through. Uh, at the center are the stairs and an elevator. Uh, and like I said before, the interior is really produces a kind of landscape of showers, plunges, changing rooms, uh, and toilets. On the second floor, you'll find the sauna on the left and the large pool here on the right. Uh, the sauna uh, is surrounded by cold and warm plunges and massage parlors, uh, while the pool is inside of a large space um, surrounded by a kind of paper beach. Uh, so here's a view of the interior of the spa area. Uh, you'll notice the paper just kind of blends into the water itself and uh, the infrastructure, things like uh, plumbing and electrical conduits are rendered the same way. It sort of constructs subsystem uh, for enclosure. Uh, in the section, you'll notice under uh, the area where this perspective is taken is a proposal for changing rooms and bathrooms. Uh, and this is a view of the pool, which ends up feeling a bit like a beach. <laughs> uh, and again, in the section on the left, you'll, you'll see uh, how the water's weight um, bears down um, in this pool house building called SAG. Uh, these are some of the different infrastructures of the project, uh, kind of highlighting all the different material and structural systems. Uh, and then we have some details that we try, started developing for how we would construct this thing. On the right, you can see, for example, um, for the paper, we would propose a PVC plastic sheets that would kind of cover uh, the windows, whereas in the other building, uh, we would have a kind of awning window that might swing. Uh, at the top of the buildings, um, in the pool house, the paper would be replaced with uh, a, if you can see here, uh, a roll of paper that you can just pull down and replace the paper with. And on the right, we have a gutter system that would re, um, recycle the water back into the bladders. Uh, and then these are some more views of the interior and the kind of intimate spaces under things are looking uh, from shower uh, to shower. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate everything. I uh, appreciate the award. Thank you for listening. Hi, we're Leslie Locke and Sasha Djokovic from HANA. We would like to thank the Arc League for the award and the opportunity to share our work here this evening. For this lecture, we will discuss the work through the lens of the competition's theme, value. The title of our portfolio submission was Invaluable Propositions. To us, an invaluable proposition is, on the one hand, aiming to advance disciplinary dialogue, and on the other hand, in addition, generate value by promoting design equity, resource efficiency, or a certain kind of environmental stewardship. At HANA, from the ground up, digital design and fabrication technologies are intrinsic to the making of our work, facilitating new material methods, 
tectonic articulations, environmental practices, technological affordances, and forms of sustainable construction. In our research labs at Cornell, we build and embrace shared technology. In the past few years, we created open source construction machines, which we argue inevitably affect how we think and design through making a HANA. In our work, we aim to mine the tension between machine means and architectural ends across scales. HANA does not obsess over technology for technology's sake. As designers, we consider ourselves to be biased generalists rather than specialists. The various projects represented in this lecture inform form through a variety of methods of making, odd material applications, robotic routines, or socio-ecological narratives. We think that fully unpacking the manufacturing tool or machine is an exciting opportunity for architects to reclaim authorship over processes of construction, which fundamentally influence the way we can build or perhaps ought to build in the future. While the machine is only a framework, our thesis is with new tools come new architectural opportunities, not just in the research lab, but primarily in practice. However, in order to conduct research in advanced manufacturing and engage new methods of making, one needs the facilities, the means, and tools to do such work. In 2016, we designed and developed a fully open source 3D printer at the Cornell Robotic Construction Laboratory. The printer costs about $6,000 to make and is now able to print full-scale building components in foam, recycled plastic, and concrete. For us, access to the tool opens the door to novel and unfamiliar architectural speculation. In 2017, one year later, we purchased a 15-year-old used KUKA industrial robotic arm for $8,000 on eBay. The robot was formerly welding cars for GM at a manufacturing plant in Louisiana. And as with the printer, a certain amount of hacking is required to prepare this robot for architectural production. Following principles of open source community information sharing, we believe that new technology comes with a social responsibility to make these tools broadly accessible to everyone. All information on how to replicate our tools is available for all through the open source factory platform on the RCL website. Our tools are never finished. They're constantly evolving with the architectural experiments we undertake at HANA. It took us about three months to develop a material mixture for concrete 3D printing. And during this process, we discovered that the 3D printer a machine which has long been characterized as characterless, because it can presumably print anything, is in fact exactly the opposite. It has plenty of character and a multiplicity of what we like to call productive constraints. Most of those constraints are informed by concrete rheology and gravity, which both became our printing frenemies. Here you see a video of our first printing process. Um, which we've done in the lab. And you see that the machine essentially prints one layer after another. Uh, it's a kind of three-dimensional drawing. In order to create three-dimensional form, the printer has to offset layers incrementally in a process very similar to structural corbelling. And this, of course, severely limits what we can print. So rather than despair in the face of limitations, we see the manipulation of 3D printing rule sets as a tremendous opportunity to add design value. We think that concrete printing requires the development of an entirely new architectural language, which takes into the account of limitation of the process as well as its performative advantages. So here in additive architectural elements, 
3D Print and Concrete, and they boast elimination of wasteful formwork and prompts the reemergence of corbeling as an anachronistic structural strategy. For this project, we chose seven prototypical architecture motifs to explore through the lens of the 3D printer. And working first with the constraint of gravity, the mushroom column element embraces cantilever corbeling over support material by printing upside down. Resulting in structural assemblies and horizontal striation that seamlessly transition between the vertical and the horizontal. And then we soon found out that the concrete printer cannot print in midair. Therefore, the simple task of creating a rectilinear window opening becomes seemingly impossible. In Corb window, rather than drastically altering the process, for example, stopping the machine to insert a beam, shortcomings become opportunities for design. So if you ask us, uh, 3D printer windows have to be triangular. The fourth column element is printed in section, which allows for careful calibration of material densities and patterns. And by depositing material where structurally necessary, the column can be optimized for forces and gravity, creating a type of transparent structural ornamentation. Similarly, Smart Push Wall explores a manipulation of concrete densities in plan, resulting in a wall which changes its composition based on structural, programmatic, or mechanical needs here. The potential for excessive ornamentation is also investigated in the adornment, where the delamination of the layers you see here creates screen-like moments of transparency. From a technical point of view, there is added economic and environmental value to 3D printing, which includes material savings, reduction of formwork waste, and the radical mass customization of components. However, there are severe shortcomings to working with concrete. The cementitious material itself has to change and become drastically more sustainable in order for 3D printing to become a viable future technology. While our concrete projects explore the benefit of 3D printing, we as designers have a responsibility to dig deeper and constantly challenge the materials we work with. So jumping scale from building elements to furniture, our next project here takes full advantage of the printer's ability to economically mass customize geometries and create a range of tailored seats for a variety of body types. The Rolling Stones project is the winning design of the Foley Function Competition in 2018. The design is deeply informed by program, and in this case is public seating. The competition brief called for a design that could be movable by visitors and staff, but solid enough that visitors are discouraged from removing it from the park. So with concrete gravity working in our favor this time around, we had the second part covered from the get-go. Leveraging movement architecturally and this folly itself, the playful design encourages creative interaction and allows park visitors to discover a variety of seating configurations while moving the seats across the lawn. Responding to scales within the park landscape, the Rolling Stones can form long continuous bench, aggregate into smaller benches, or disperse to form solitary compositions. And each seat has three configurations. Some enable a more upright seating position, while others animate lounging and relaxation. In Rolling Stones, 3D printing with concrete enables the creation of 25 affordable and self-similar, but ultimately entirely individual seats. And no longer bound to the relentless paradigm of standardization, 3D printing opens the possibility for design freedom, 
customization, and individuality. As is evident in this photo, concrete is indeed hard to steal or row. So on to another type of loop. Environmental cycles, birth, growth, and decay are intrinsic to complex forest ecosystems and processes. Conceptually and spatially, the Lognot project references these eternal cycles and reciprocal relationships between systems, both natural and technical. Lognot was designed in collaboration with Brian Havener at RCL and is a project that emerged from our first initial exploration with custom wood-based tools for the robot. It enables the construction of complex timber curvature with raw material and minimal farm work. In a reciprocal design process, the project fosters synergies and feedback between material, fabrication, digital form, and full-scale construction. As a building material, we encounter wood in the shape of two by fours or plywood or other standardized dimensions. But trees are, as you can see in the background, inherently non-standard by nature. They have forks, they're not straight, they have all kinds of shapes. Small roundwood members or tree forks are usually not used for construction because today's sawmills are not equipped to process irregular tree geometries. But with a robotic arm and 3D scanning, we can process irregular trees and round wood members. The mortise and tenon joints for log knot are milled in four separate operations from rough pass to finishing cut using both the tip and the side of the milling spindle bit. The project uses computation to optimize each joint for moment forces. While they all look the same, each of these joints is precisely rotated and calibrated to resist local torsion. Working with small budgets, we did not have access to heavy machinery and therefore developed a self-sufficient construction method that requires minimal formwork or support during the construction process. Unfamiliar notions of craftsmanship and precision, both digital and analog, emerge from Lognot's conceptual design practice and construction technique. By questioning how forests are used as a resource, Lognot provides a critical commentary on various perpetual wood cycles, economic, environmental, and cultural in nature. Our last and latest project, Ash and Cabin, also has some uh, similarities to the previous project and shares its forest uh, heritage. And that project follows two material narratives and is a culmination of HANA's applied design research as a critical practice. In the first material narrative, the project aims to reveal 3D printing's idiosyncratic tectonic language by exploring how the layering of concrete and the act of corbeling can suggest new strategies for building. The cabin was built in two phases. In 2017, we did the concrete, and then in 2019, we did the second part, which is a wooden uh, envelope. The cabin is printed in components that function as sacrificial zero waste formwork for the main structure to eliminate substantial construction waste. The formwork is printed in small sectional modules to be transported and assembled manually at the remote construction site. In this project, we developed a new building process reliant upon 3D printed formwork and cast in place concrete with custom rebar. And here's a top view of the structure with the rebar cages. In this hybrid building process, unfamiliar tectonic expression is generated by the fabrication method and materiality. For example, the G-code and print path become visible as the ornamental pattern of the 3D printed floor slabs. Through corbeling, horizontal layers seamlessly transition from the leg to the slab and then into the chimney. 
Gently adapting to the site, the concrete structure lifts off the ground on legs which adjust to the sloped terrain. It is characterized by three programmatic areas, a table, a storage seat element, and a 21 foot tall fireplace. The second material narrative focuses on a robotically fabricated wood envelope and is informed by a key environmental crisis And this invasive EAB th currently threatens to eradicate most of the 8.7 billion ash trees in North America. And it has drastically transformed our entire forest ecosystems in the process. Just as a reference, almost every 10th tree in New York State is an ash tree. The EAB infestation is a huge environmental problem and climate risk. So while we're designers cannot help the dying trees, we believe that infested trees form an enormous and untapped material resource for sustainable wood construction. Challenging preconceived notions about material standards in wood, the cabin utilizes infested wood for its envelope, which unfortunately is widely considered as waste. Each of the 10 trees we use in this project is worth only about 25 cents. And due to their challenging geometries, many infested ash trees cannot be processed by regular sawmills and are therefore regarded as unsuitable for construction. So by implementing high precision 3D scanning and robotic-based fabrication technology, um, as you can see in this quick clip here, irregularly shaped waste wood transform into abundantly available, affordable, and morbidly sustainable building material for the Anthropocene. And using the robot with a custom bandsaw end effector, we can slice irregular tree logs into naturally curved boards and strategically assemble the boards to form different surfaces conditions. Which then inform the design of the building and vice versa. The slice boards are arrayed into interlocking sit facade panels and solid offcuts can be structurally integrated into assembly, which then results in a minimum waste fabrication method so as you see here, the facade assembly um, is actually fully ventilated, detailed to manage shrinkage, and it does not require an additional ring screen. Architecturally speaking, the Ashen Cabin walks the line between familiar and unfamiliar, between technologically advanced and formally elemental. The undulating wood surfaces accentuate the building's program and yet remain reminiscent of the natural log geometry which they are derived from. And the curvature of the wood is strategically deployed to highlight these moments of architectural importance such as windows, entrances, roofs, drain scuppers, or canopies. On the inside of the cabin, we use predominantly straight log sections to create a contrast between the exterior and interior. So no longer bound to the paradigm of timber standardization, this project revisits woodcraft and design based on organic, found, and living materials. The cabin combines a variety of fabrication methods material applications, geometries, and types of construction. We believe that using newly invented forms of making from the ground up at the scale of a building affords unfamiliar and exciting design opportunities. At various scales, the cabin's performance, structure, and architectural expression 
are inherently derived from its digital construction protocols, robotic routines, materiality, and design logics. At the same time, in a mix of means, the project is inspired by precedent, history, program, ecological considerations, personal obsessions, and the creative misuse of technology. Together, the various and sometimes conflicting means, robotic or otherwise, inherently inform the creation of, our, of architectural expression and value within our work. We would like to thank our amazing and dedicated HANA team, and we would also like to thank and acknowledge our collaborators, sponsors, as well as Cornell AAP for their extraordinary support. Thank, thank you. you. Here we all are in different different environments and clothes. <laughs> yes. Everybody dressed differently. Um, thank you guys. This is an amazing uh, set of presentations. Before we uh, go into our discussion here uh, and Q&A session, um, I just want to remind the uh, general audience uh, about Project Pipeline, uh, about your generous donations to uh, NOMAS Project Pipeline. Uh, this year, the winners have committed to, donate, to donating a portion of their honoraria to NOMAS Project Pipeline and encourage all of you uh, to support this important educational and mentorship program. You can find the link here tonight as well as on the landing page for this program uh, on the LEAKS website. Uh, it will be posted uh, in the chat. Um, also, this is going to uh, give you some continuing education credits, 1.5 New York State uh, AIACUs. Uh, registered viewers uh, who join the Zoom, if they stay all the way through, are eligible for these credits. Please email the league at uh, rspp at archleague.org uh, with your full name and AI number so you can get the uh, full credit. All right. Um, Really beautiful presentations, uh, both practices. Congratulations again. Uh, I think the work is incredibly inspiring um, where you are in your careers. Uh, solid presentations, clear arguments, um, kind of really um, kind of impressed by the way um, you put your thought process together, represented uh, kind of your arguments within the team of the competition. Um, Couple of things are inescapable, I think, to uh, compare, contrast, uh, and maybe begin to uh, engage directly between two practices. And uh, one of those things, of course, is materiality. Um, I think um, um, there are different takes on, you're not, you're not um, uh, kind of uh, material lovers in the sense that um, you are not there to expose an essence of materiality. Uh, you are not phenomenologists in the classical sense, uh, yet uh, you do engage phenomena towards um, kind of new, uh, towards new aesthetics, towards new sensibilities. Uh, but materiality operates kind of uh, differently in each practice. Um, I'm curious, maybe this per question first goes, goes to David. Um, like paper is actually, at the end, I realize it's never representational. It's, um, you're talking about a bad house that has paper in it. Um, and it, it, at first it's kind of unbelievable, uh, but there's a degree of plausibility in the way you represent this and the way you uh, kind of stick to this idea. Uh, it begins to get uh, quite provocative, uh, quite uh, kind of enticing. I'm curious, um, how would you engage this if you were to say, okay, you know what? We want a bad house in paper. Um, and uh, I ask this with all sincerity um, to, to find out what, what the ways of kind of imagining that world can become plausible, can become real. So the kind of incredible sensory uh, images you put in front of us uh, can be shared with others. Um, 
Well, uh, first, Kutan, thank you so much for the really nice introduction. That was very, um, very beautiful. Uh, I think it's, um, it's a good question. Uh, paper in my work has um, sort of taken different directions. And up until the bathhouse project, it was always um, something that existed in, in models only. And it's, um, it's moved towards an architecture was a bit ambiguous. Uh, and it was sort of a standalone like idea of uh, when we make a model and we have to put material, the geometry, what kind of happens in that space. For the, the bathhouse, the idea I think was to do something which um, screamed temper, that it was temporary <laughs> and not necessarily permanent. It could be moved across these sites in LA, um, easily assembled, et cetera. And there's, a, there's definitely an absurdity to taking like, you know, whatever paper it might be, a building paper, a Tyvek perhaps just because they're a little bit more durable, but um, that over time, no matter what, it would take on, um, uh, you know, like environmental qualities in the same way that um, I've been thinking of how our bodies themselves take on, you know, like degrade over time and we have to work them out and maintain them. And I was kind of interested in doing a proposal for a bathhouse that would have to also continue to be maintained um, uh, and continue to take on these like qualities of, uh, a paper material that would be something that as architects we think of as fully representational, fully inside of models maybe, or fully something we put drawings on. Um, but in this case would be something that would be so, um, so palpable uh, and so uh, frustrating probably uh, <laughs> to have to continue to like, um, you know, fix it or replace it. Uh, you could dry yourself off after. I guess you take a shower uh, with a wall, um, but it was a, it was more of a sense of like taking this kind of thing that had been very conceptual in my mind for a while, uh, and um, just being very literal with it. And you know, there's a lot of architects that have worked very literally with paper. I'm thinking of like Sugar Ruban and, and his emergency um, paper tube housing uh, projects, uh, and I really appreciate those for a number of reasons. But I, my my sense of it was to do something a little bit more. Um, uh, less proper, I guess, with like the sense of like paper uh, tubes being, oh, it's cheap, we can use it for anything, but doing something that would um, produce this kind of, I don't know, environmental environmental effect a little bit. Um, yeah, it's so funny to watch uh, uh, Leslie and Sasa's lecture because I, I really see all the overlaps that I can see we're probably going to discuss. So that was a really nice pairing. Yeah, I mean, on, on that note, maybe uh, Leslie and Sasa, um, like really, truly uh, inspirational uh, set of operations uh, that um, you're inventing, uh, the protocols, um, dealing materiality in a way where um, I kind of refuse to believe seeing the work and the processes that, um, that, that the outcome is surprising for you. Like the outcome is uh, not necessarily, well, if you just follow these protocols, we get what we get. Um, looking at the ashen cabin, um, I, I think um, kind of um, an architectural primitive uh, at, at, uh, at, you know, at the broadest definition, um, there are very specific kind of articulations that, that are borderline bizarre, uh, borderline um, kind of just flat out strange uh, and interesting. Um, it doesn't reside uh, in the primitive at all, uh, because my argument would be if you if you were okay with just uh, uh, just leaving with uh, processing of the materials, you would end up in a, some sort of primitive. But we don't end up there. We end up in a very specific geometry. We end up in a very specific kind of detailing, something that is governed um, maybe meta material, uh, maybe beyond uh, your processes, and that's. That's being a designer. That's uh, how you guide that uh, process. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, besides the fabrication processes that you go through, uh, how do you govern a larger set of aesthetic ideas uh, in terms of materiality? Well, I mean, I, I think that's, that's a really interesting um, question, which does relate to issues of materiality also, I would argue. I think in our work, there are two types of uh, systems in place. Uh, one is the 
the kind of inf informed by fabrication and by materiality, a type of bottom-up system that is uh, playing with the rules of fabrication and, and material properties. And then the other is acknowledging that when we, when we scale to, to architecture uh, and the building, that there are other types of constraints, maybe top-down decisions that have to be made or can be made uh, that interact with these material systems. And uh, those can be informed by, by other constraints or issues or, or interests or obsessions of ours. And I think it's sort of this dialogue uh, that we aim to explore in, in the built work that we're doing. Um, and that's the kind of uh, thing that we're interested in exploring um, in, in these prototypes. Yeah, I think your reading of how um, it's not just about using the tools and then following the process is, you know, really on point because um, I would say that the process is is part of it. And then we we develop, let's say we construct the tools to enable us to explore what we're interested in architecturally. So um, what Sasha is talking about, kind of mining the tension between these two poles or two forces um, is, is where then the manifestation of form or aesthetics and design um, that begin to emerge. And, and there's a certain, certain liberty in that because one can overcome constraints of either the fabrication system or the, the, the sort of uh, programmatic uh, limitations that might come with, with an architecture. And, and these two things are, uh, I guess, uh, so that, that type of reciprocity is what we're, what we're trying to explore or what we're after um, in, in these, in these in, I, I would say in all of the projects at different scales. Yeah, and I actually quite enjoy um, David's, uh, the project, the first project where you talked about the scale, like with the door. I mean, I think we both, you know, had deal with the door and opening and, you know, working with the constraints and scale. So in your case, it's about scale. And then that's something that can't be, you know, manipulated um, because of its programmatic constraints. And then, you know, for us, in the case of additive architectural elements, um, you know, it needs to go through a certain size and scale as well, but also then limited by the constraints of the material, what the printer can print and what it cannot print that then resulted into a triangular opening, for example. In maybe one thing uh, that came up, um, you know, in your presentation, and we can maybe reverse the order here, um, is a question of authorship. I mean, both practices, um, kind of engage technical, technological mediation and material mediation uh, to set forth um, ideas with regards to what we imagine architecture can be. Um, there is perhaps a spectrum of the discipline which would argue the authorship to take a back step um, and disappear um, from the foreground. Um, but you seem to be at a different place. Um, and uh, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, I certainly celebrate that. I have no fear of uh, kind of uh, expressing uh, perhaps self-obsessions within one's practice. Um, the question uh, for me there, uh, within that mediation, um, technology plays a role in both practices. Um, perhaps uh, more uh, apparent in Hannah's and uh, less so uh, in Dest. Um, where do you kind of situate the questions of technology and authorship um, in, your, uh, in your early projects? W was that for us or for, yes, for, for David? <laughs> uh, um, well, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question because we kind of operate uh, as an experimental research practice in two realms. We, we are both doing research in research labs uh, at Cornell that we direct. And so authorship within a research lab is a slightly different concept than authorship within a practice. And I think we use the practice deliberately to explore our own agencies or authorships or sort of design obsessions that, that we want to explore that are different from the types of investigations and research and prototype experiments that we do in the, in the lab. And uh, so for us, the practice is a creative vessel to explore a very specific type of authorship that is, I would say, very biased. 
And um, that's quite different from the work that we do in the lab. Obviously, one can't function without the other. And so they, they rely on, on these different modes of authorship uh, to inform each other. D David, j just maybe, just as a note, uh, when we jump, I think uh, I have to say it, uh, you, you made an incredibly profound uh, kind of presentation about uh, your own personal agency uh, as an author. Um, and I, I think that th th that's just an uh, incredible way of presenting uh, one's ideas. I, I just want to call that out um, and, and say I truly appreciate that. And uh, I wanted to kind of ask that uh, authorship question in the, in the context of uh, how you present it. Yeah, well, thanks, Kutan, because I, it's something I've been thinking a bit about over the last few years, and certainly in the last month, really thinking about, which is, um, you know, the, so much of how we've been taught uh, has been about this question of authorship and the removal in such a way of, of our personal authorship through like shared systems, shared processes, shared technologies, et cetera. And while I fully understand its value, I think we're also at a point in society where those kinds of things have hidden some of our, of who's included in those, in the ability to be a part of being able to mask authorship, et cetera. Um, and, you know, who can participate, who can, who can take that on. And one question that I've, I've been trying to sort out in my work is like that is that sort of uh, that sense that we can do things that are not personal or try not to be personal, but at what cost, right? At what cost does it, do we sort of push things away from ourselves as authors in, a, uh, in the sense that we're not telling certain stories or acknowledging, let's say, um, maybe things that are under the surface about our own perspectives and things like that. And I think for the, for, I don't know, or if that's really coming through in, the, in my own work yet, but it's certainly something that I've been thinking about. And um, I don't know that we need to go like full on personal and not have, be able to have any kind of shared discussion either. Um, but I do think that, uh, let's say, well, maybe I'm thinking of, the, of like the project of autonomy, which is a little bit of a separate thing altogether from authorship. But um, uh, I think this question of who makes the work is so important uh, to be thinking about, especially I think in the last 10 years, we've really been confronting that question in, in all the arts, uh, in all of, uh, uh, especially in architecture. And I think as we're young, um, younger generations kind of entering, young architects at least, um, I think it's a super important question to be asking of like, how is our, who we are contribute to the work that we're producing and where does it and where doesn't it? Because obviously it can't everywhere. Um, so I'm not, and again, I don't know if it, it totally makes sense in my own work, if that's so clear, but uh, definitely something that's been on my mind. I think uh, we have five minutes before we uh, incorporate some QA. Um, I, um, you, you could do it yourselves, uh, but maybe I can frame it for you. Um, if, because uh, I think what I wanted to touch uh, in the intro, uh, touch upon in the intro was to kind of perhaps identify these, uh, you know, separate interests within disciplines and your centers might be closer. Um, but what are the overlapping questions for you? Um, maybe if you can identify one thing in each other's practice that you learned today uh, that made you think, oh, I didn't think that was possible. I didn't imagine the world could be like that. Uh, whether it's a small detail, a uh, small idea, uh, whether it's uh, something in a plan or a quality of representation uh, that, uh, that you can commonly establish almost as a link between two practices. Uh, that would be kind of great. Well, I, I have to say, I love, I haven't seen the, uh, the log plots, and I love those, uh, not log, not log, I mean, it's like a tongue twister. <laughs> uh, I thought those were amazing, and uh, like both in the sense of like producing this kind of spatial figure, but um, in the kind of like, what you guys were talking about of like you know, putting geometry fabrication to these uh, rough, hewn uh, uh, logs. I love when you see those like big fat, you know, like log 
intersections. I don't know. Like those things are, I think they're, they're rough. They're a little bit clumsy, but they're super precise. And I thought that that was really beautiful. I don't know if that's a question, but I, that's what I learned. I was like, oh, wow. And I love the house too. It's really incredible. Or if it's a house, I'm not sure, but. Thank you, David. Um, for for me, you know, in today's presentation, what really um, sort of sparked um, a moment of interest is actually how we both deal with gravity, um, how gravity affects our work, um, in, in the case of the paper and how you're simulating um, gravity and the incorporating a deformation. Um, it's gravity becomes really important in considering um, the design and, you know, I think influence your thinking and also saying with us, especially in the first two project where we, uh, projects where we discussed the, the concrete, the working with um, concrete at full scale and how gravity makes it, you know, makes a project do certain things and actually make it really challenging and not be on our side. We call it like a frenemies. Um, whereas, you know, in the second project, the gravity of the concrete, the way became our friend because, you know, people can steal the chairs. Um, so um, I think how we, in that sense, deal with certain very kind of both practical uh, constraints, but, um, but also kind of conceptually how that, you know, influence our work in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the you know the the explorations that you're doing, David, in, in paper, the misuse of gravity mm -hmm. or the play with it um, is is really fascinating, and seeing uh, seeing how how this sort of material notion uh, translates into different scales um, is is something quite remarkable, and and uh, as Kutan has pointed out, the sort of rigor that goes into these experimentations. Um, is something that that's really fascinating and um, um, something that's going to make me think a bit about you know uh, uh, the the role of gravity in in our work. I think something that we had that we have in common uh, perhaps is there there's a certain quest or evaluation or exploration of notions of precision and imprecision in in both uh, mm -hmm. practices work, and it plays out in different ways in different sort of material relationships. Um, and, and there, there are certain kind of overlaps that, that we shared there, I would say, as well. Well, I hope you keep up the discussion going forward. I think the community that develops around um, these, uh, these awards, uh, uh, it, it's a um, kind of long-term discourse, hopefully. And um, I think that exchange is important for these ideas to move forward and uh, take on other lives through uh, hybridization and collaboration. Um, I'm going to kind of uh, relay some questions from the audience. Um, I want to, uh, let's see, um, there are a few of them. I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them, but uh, let's see. Um, thank you for present. This is from uh, Stephanie Lloyd. Uh, thank you for presenting and congratulations. My question, both of these practices fundamentally interrogate the nature of the building envelope is a mediating device for both tectonic logic and aesthetic agenda. On a spectrum between envelope as surface and envelope as volume, where do you see each of your practices landing? Uh, well, I mean, maybe I can, I can uh, start. I think that that's a, the mediating the envelope is a mediating surface tectonic aesthetic each other yeah i um uh I, at least for me in, a, in a, the last two projects that i presented i think that the um it's really important to, i guess to be able to read the paper and like see it and see what it does and therefore it ends up as a as you know the envelope or the exterior of the building and, and in that sense it's both uh some kind of tectonic and some kind of aesthetic uh, in the sense that you must understand um, how it came to be in the model at some point. Um, and uh, I don't know, like I think that the for at least the work uh, that I've been doing has always been asking to read its exterior or read its surfaces or under or like look closely at them. Maybe not reading is not necessarily the right term, but um, to sort of think through uh, how their performance um, has come to be. Um, and so I'm not sure that it, it's always so much about tectonics and aesthetics, but more of, let's say, its presence is important um, to, 
somehow be paying attention to it in some sort of close way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in, for example, in our Ashen Cabin project, the envelope takes on two different kinds of roles. It's a protective surface in, in some ways, and it's uh, literally made out of logs that have been turned into surfaces. So it's very much an exploration about uh, surface conditions at the same time I would argue that, that the project reads both or aims to read as both surface and volume because the envelope is, is calibrated in a way that it, that it allows for a reading of internal programmatic forces mm -hmm. and sort of a pushing and pulling of, uh, of what goes on on the inside of the cabin that is then displayed into the outside. And so deliberately um, also dissolving the envelope at the, at the chimney uh, to allow someone to read its surface conditions. So it goes from a very, very thin board to something that reads much more volumetric on the other side of the cabin. So this is kind of an interest of ours mm -hmm. to explore the uh, hybrid condition between volume and, mm -hmm. and surface. And the, the reading of the surface is um, maybe another way to elaborate is also is, is a double kind of double skin surface. It's almost a thin surface. Um, what Sasha was talking about, the sort of exterior um, articulation, protrusion, or interior bulging, they all respond to programs. So, so the surface is, is programmatic, it's performative in the nature of what an envelope should do, but um, uh, the, thickening, the thickening of it to accommodate the programmatic expression is, um, I think it's, it's, where we, it's where we find the reading of the surface kind of different and interesting for us. All right, next one. Um, what wonderful talks. I really appreciate the informal, formal qualities of the work in both cases, which I imagine would mask the degree of technical expertise required to produce them, either speculatively or as in the case of Love Knot, for instance, IRL, to people outside of architecture. Oops. Uh, sorry, uh, to people outside of architecture. Architecture suffers sometimes from hiding behind either eminently digestible or overly complex forms. How do you think the beautiful primitism you seem to be developing relates to the public perception of architectural value and labor? I'll let, I'll let you guys go first because you got, you were specifically Sneaky. mentioned. <laughs> that's a good question. That's, uh, that's, that's a long and, and uh, complex question with, with multiple, multiple layers. Let me, let me take another look. Um, so um, certainly, I mean, what, what, is, what is occurring in our work, um, there, there is this kind of uh, tension between uh, technology versus um, the, the sort of actual hard labor that one has to put into it. And one could argue that there is a certain, exp that is expressed on the outside by the roughness of, of the wood, by the way we've uh, uh, allowed the wood to be readable still as a kind of natural artifact. Um, now, how that might change the public perception, perception of uh, artificial value, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I mean, it, it certainly uh, maybe, um, redirects our own discourse a bit um, by just being able to showcase that just because it's made by a robot doesn't necessarily mean a certain type of aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this is something that we're, that we're uh, trying to really tease out in the work. Uh, so that, I would say, is deliberate. And uh, so, I mean, I see that kind of as an maybe more as an internal dialogue is necessarily a, a public outreach of some sort. Um, but we had some really interesting reactions from the public uh, when they asked us, you know, what this sort of log st structure is about or what, how, what really determines the logic of the envelope of yeah. the cabin. Yeah, and maybe on the, the, the sort of how public perceive it, um, I think is inevitably related to um, also aesthetics. Um, and I think because of, let's say, maybe the way that we applied or used the material and translate into the, the physical um, artifact that it's familiar 
and unfamiliar at the same time. And I think the familiarity is what um, also to a degree allowed the public to engage, um, at least in the sort of feedback like conversation that we had with other people outside of architecture. Um, and, um, and then the unfamiliar part is, I think that's our doing, <laughs> our author on kind of translating, how do we transform um, through, you know, our, our creative uh, process. David, a uh, question for you uh, from our Marslinga. Um, David Leslie says, uh, thank you for your thoughtful lectures. David, in relation to, in relation to slump model, can you please speak about the potential for forms of weak resistance in architecture? How might, how might this change the way we practice and what we design? Oh, that's, that's a good question, Marcelin. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that the, well, when we say, talk about resistance in architecture, I suppose what we're, what we're talking about is the idea that architects are always employed by theoretically by by clients and you know um, are part of some kind of capitalist machine, at least in the current sense. But always somehow in bed with with power and um, so resistance would be as an architect, uh, how do you produce forms of resistance within that? Um, so one option would be to not be an architect, uh, but let's say if you are going to be one, I suppose, um, how do you produce a kind of resistance while still building? Um, uh, I, I, I appreciate that reading of it, the weak resistance, Marcelin. Um, I think that that's definitely something that I was beginning to think of in um, that slip model. It was sort of something that many other architects have, have asked these kinds of questions before and have and looked to the physical model and to paper architecture uh, as somehow um, producing thoughts of uh, uh, of, of creating an intellectual project beyond just what the building is, let's say. Um, for me, the slump model is a little bit, it's kind of lazy. It's like just like slumping. It's taking those materials that come from that tradition uh, uh, in you know, the last 50 years of architecture, that sort of conceptual um, project and uh, uh, allows it to be a little bit like very raw and very real and, and um, uh, it doesn't so much feel like intellectual resistance. I know earlier I was talking about reading. I don't think it's asking in that, in that sense to read the architecture. You just look at it, you can go in it, it's flexible, you can touch it. Um, it's very palpable. Um, and um, so I, I, I don't know that uh, how exactly one would produce a weaker or stronger resistance or if resistance as an architect is even all that possible, but um, I, I would I think that the there is a sense in that model in that installation to do something that was not so trying hard to be like hard and 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 uh, even geometric and standing up, but it was just kind of like giving in a little bit. Um, and in that sense, uh, I, I actually thought that the idea of giving in um, might be actually a kind of resistance to the thoughts that I've been taught for so long. Um, it was a kind of, of saying that maybe maybe giving in is okay uh, when you are trying to make a living, let's say, or or whatever it is, um, and and that maybe there's an architecture that it's not giving in, but that it's it's struggling with its conditions. I guess I don't know. I'm not sure, Marcelin, but I think that that would be <laughs> that would be the general place I would I would kind of land my answer. All right, I'm gonna. Uh kind of uh, put, I think, what's going to be the last question, and I'm going to hybridize uh, one last thing I have in my mind. Uh, the question comes from Lydia Yen um, for everyone. How does your own identity or inspiration influence uh, your artwork? And how do you transition from the conceptual space to the manifestation of an idea? Um, and I think maybe I want to kind of add to the end of that. I think your identities as practitioners and architects and designers cannot be complete without the fact that you're all teachers and you're all, um, uh, you're involved heavily in academia. Uh, you write uh, quite a bit. Uh, I'm actually jealous amount of the uh, stuff you have written already in your early careers. Um, and somehow your practices probably are unimaginable uh, without the companionship of teaching. 
Um, so um, in that definition of identity, um, in addition to your, you know, uh, personal identity, I, I, I would want to ask, um, how does kind of teaching in relationship to the way you practice influence the way uh, you view architecture, allows you to make decisions? How do you think differently about the world through teaching uh, uh, as you practice architecture? Um, I, that's a, I think teaching is um, a really integral part in um, how we even approach or think about our own work. Um, I think what uh, teaching allows us to do, you know, we're always constantly asking questions, you know, in our students' work, and it kind of brings in this other this lens of interrogating our own work. And I think this level of interrogation then actually happens at multiple levels um, from uh, materials to tools, to process, um, to um, uh, how do we, you know, how do we maybe address a certain criticality in, in the work? Um, so I think this process of questioning is is something that we learn I mean you we learned in school as students but I think more so important in teaching um, is learning to how to ask the right question or the, not the right question but you know the questions that would prompt students to think and I think that we do it to ourselves too and at the same time uh, I think there's a there's quite a literal involvement mm -hmm. in the work also that we want to acknowledge I mean the tools were built uh, as option studios uh, in collaboration with students so mm -hmm. this is something that um, uh, is sort of deeply influenced and collaborative um, uh, as an as an enterprise at the same time you know for all of these projects we are our own contractors mm -hmm. uh, together with usually a group of students uh, building this trying to figure out how to make it work and how to realize it at the one-to-one -one scale so that's a that's a different that's another kind of uh, engagement that that occurs as well and uh, there's an incredible uh, exchange uh, going on I would say uh, between uh, ourselves and everyone else who's involved in, in these projects. And maybe on that similar note, it's, it's also um, like while we're teaching our students, we're teaching ourselves uh, as well because we're also uh, constantly, you know, discovering and testing. Um, and a lot of the time we do do it with our students and, uh, and they are, they have been an integral um, part of our team. And, and especially in a, let's say, research studio or research uh, academic context, uh, I think it's really important to note that teaching often uh, and usually always goes both ways. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's, a, there's a lot that we learn from our students uh, that is sort of continuously uh, through, through these types of uh, uh, engagements. Uh, yeah, for me, it's... Uh, I think some of the work that I do, I, I, I do mostly as a, uh, for my teaching sometimes, um, meaning like I'll produce things that are, are there to set up a pedagogy for a studio. Um, for example, before I was teaching uh, at SciArc where I teach now, I was doing these uh, two fellowships, one at Ohio State and one at the University of Michigan. And um, the work that I did was at the University of Michigan was to produce uh, as, like aesthetic objects that in my mind would uh, lend themselves to writing a first year pedagogy uh, and recently I've been able to actually like do that <laughs> and I kind of implemented the, um, the two cylinders uh, the, the scroll uh, project um, I think of as fully pedagogical because uh, it's kind of like a diagram of uh, these relations about materials and geometry um, and so I think like for me, I don't know, the, the practice as a young teacher is 100% a part of, of teaching. Obviously, I love working with the students. I think they're incredible um, and with my colleagues, but I've always thought of the work as being there to produce new thoughts in architecture and the teaching to be ways of thinking of how to teach those things. So. Um, uh, by going in, in my work, I, I always thought that I was kind of going somewhere very base about uh, what architecture is, how we draw, how we make models, and therefore that's why I thought that would make sense for a first year curriculum or pedagogy. Um, uh, and that's kind of where I'm generally thinking of things. So like the bathhouse is 
an incredible project. But to me, it's also a way to think through, uh, you know, not a first year studio, but a studio that takes on other questions about community, about building, uh, like whose space it is, how things get made, uh, et cetera, within the realm of the questions I've been working on, which are models and drawings. Yep. Well, I think that's going to be our time. Um, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations again. Um, fantastic presentations. And um, I look forward to seeing uh, where you take this and um, how you grow. Oh, well, thank you so much. I'm going to chime in. I'm, I'm Ann Rieselbach, the League's Program Director, and I'd like to thank everyone. Um, there's still over 100 of you here, which is great, um, for joining the second night of lectures by and conversations with this year's League Prize winners. And on behalf of the League, I'd like to thank the League Prize Committee. In addition to Kutan, Kevin Hurth, and Mira Henry developed this year's competition theme and um, chose and worked alongside additional members of the jury, Lucia L.A., Paul Lewis, Anna Pujaner, and Nanaka Umamoto to select this year's winners. And then the winners themselves for their ability to shift so ably and creatively to an online only format during the ongoing confusion that was the spring as we find our way this summer. Um, we hope that you can join us again next Wednesday for the final set of presentations. And I also hope you've had a chance to view the online exhibition, which launched on the league's website earlier this week. The installations, which each truly exemplify each firm's architectural focus and underlying philosophy, can be found alongside interviews and biographical information, and in the future, the videos of these lectures. As I mentioned last week, all of this material was realized in collaboration with League staff members, Katarina Flaxman, Sarah Wessler, Ann Carlisle, Nana Sashirakawa, and the lectures these past couple weeks with Daniel Tropi. Britt Cobb and Michael Beirut of Pentagram once again designed the compelling competition graphics. Michael has been designing graphics for this program since its inception in 1981. And the team of the School of Construction Environments and the Sheila C. Johnson Design Center at Parsons School of Design at the New School. Um, they posted these lectures in the exhibits in the, for the past decade. We hope we'll be back there next year. They consulted on the digital format for the exhibit and are sharing this with the full Parsons community. The entire League Prize po program is made possible by the enthusiastic ongoing support from Hunter Douglas Architectural, Kubani Judlow, and Tischler and Son. Support is also provided by the Next Generation Fund, an alumni fund of the Architectural League's Emerging Voices in Architectural League um, past winners, um, as well as the J. Clausen Mills Fund of the League. League programs are also made possible by public funds. Um, from the New York State City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew M. Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. And of course, every online program, every live program, every, everything is supported by the commitment and support of the League's members and friends. Please check the League's website. We um, are packing July with events. We have three different things happening next week. Um, Actually, we have one next week and three the following week. Um, so check out the website. Anyone can sign up for our newsletter to learn what we're doing and to read about all of our programs and also considering joining the league. And you can find information about that on the website too. So thanks all. Um, it's been another really interesting evening of lectures and um, we will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.